With COP26 to open in Glasgow, UK, just 48 hours later, all eyes are on China once again. On Wednesday, China issued a white paper titled Responding to Climate Change, China's Policies and Actions. What are the significant changes in China's climate approach? What's the progress in achieving a green, low-carbon lifestyle? And what's unique about China's approach to mitigate climate change? Joining me today from Beijing is Professor Teng Fei, Deputy Director of the Institute of Energy, Environment and Economy at Tsinghua University and from Durham, North Carolina, Jackson Irwin, Senior Fellow at Duke University's Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. Uh, before we go into the question, here's a quick look at some key progress China has made in slashing carbon emissions. According to the White Paper, for instance, in 2020, China's carbon intensity was more than 48 percent lower than 2005 levels. That means China has more than achieved its target in the 13th five-year plan, which was uh, to reduce carbon intensity by between 40 to 45 percent. The proportion of coal in total energy consumption dropped by more than 15 percent from 2005 levels to 2020, and non-fossil energy is 8.5 percentage points up from 2005 of China's total energy consumption. Professor Teng, uh, you are an expert on the impact of, econo of uh, energy on the environment and economy. What is China's progress, as I highlighted, in using green and less energy mean for the environment and the economy? I think that means a lot. Firstly, that to use green and um, less energy means to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions substantially and also means to reduce environmental pollutants substantially. Because of 90% uh, of China's carbon dioxide emission came from fossil fuel combustion, and also more than 50% of air pollutants also came from fossil fuel combustion. So use green and less energy will reduce those emissions substantially and contribute to emission reduction, air quality improvement. Mm. And also those uh, green and less energy also uh, create new jobs for Chinese people uh, according to the data that the new energy generate more than 5 million jobs in China uh, on the production of renewable energy. And also that also means a lot that to contribute to the global efforts to, re to reduce emission because of China uh, exports a lot of those solar panel and wind turbine to other countries right. to contribute to the emission at global level. Mm. Mr. Irwin, what does China's policy signify to you about China's climate change commitments, especially achieving carbon neutrality before the year 2060? Uh, which piece of policy would you regard as the most significant by now? I agree with all of Professor Tong's points just made. The 2060 carbon neutrality target set at the UN General Assembly one and a half years ago now was a surprise to many China watchers and a welcome development in setting a long-term goal for China's emissions trajectory. Questions now going into COP26 really center around what the short-term actions will be that put China on that trajectory. Part of that certainly will be to peak emissions prior to 2030, but when China will peak specifically and at what aggregated emissions level uh, remain open questions and will be relevant to the overall global effort to keep temperature increases below two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. China has there are several very China? important yeah, policies Mr. Yeah, uh, Mr. to answer your question. Mr. Irwin. Most impactful there uh, that I would highlight, uh, most yeah. importantly perhaps would be a combination of effective power sector reform that can get some uh, a greater uh, representation of the renewable energy that Professor Tung just mentioned uh, to consumers and onto the grid efficiently and effectively. And also China's national emissions trading scheme which has been operational since this summer uh, and has the potential to really drive mm. many of these national targets uh, to Mr. successful Irwin, now, China has, Mr. Irwin, China has pledged that non-fossil fuel will account for 80 percent of China's energy usage by 2060. How ambitious is this goal? That's a highly ambitious goal. Again, it's 
pushed out a number of decades into the future. So reaching that goal in practice will require China to continue not only to roll out renewable infrastructure at scale, which it's been doing to an impressive level for many years now, um, but also to ensure that that renewable energy is fit for purpose for consumers at household levels, at industrial levels, uh, that it can fuel the electrification of the transportation fleet and so forth. And that's going to require further infrastructure in the grid, both hard and soft, uh, including finding ways to ensure that renewable, including hydro, nuclear, and certainly solar and wind, okay. can ultimately outpace uh, the, the growth and, and lead to fairly steep declines in the consumption of coal and subsequently gas and mm -hmm. oil in the Chinese economy. The just released white paper says China has found a unique path to reducing greenhouse gas emissions that conforms to its actual conditions. Professor Tung, what's unique about this path and how efficient, how effective is it going to be? I think there are many unique uh, characteristics, but I'd like to highlight two of them. The first one is challenge is unique, that most of developed countries pick their emission when their economy has developed, but China needs to achieve this carbon picking together with the development of the economy. So the uh, challenge is quite unique. And the second point is uh, the enforcement is quite unique in China. Ch China takes full advantage of its institutional advantage that because China has a very powerful central government and central government allocate those targets to local government and establish a, a responsibility and accountability system to make sure those targets can be efficiently delivered. Uh, but however, that those, uh, um, those uh, command and control uh, policy and matters is not very efficient in terms of cost effectiveness. So as Professor Evans said that uh, in uh, this year, China has established a carbon market, which covers more than 2,000 power companies right now and covers more than 4 billion tons of carbon dioxide, which make the Chinese a, a, a carbon market, the biggest one uh, in the world. And in the future, China will use this two-wheel strategy. The um, command and control plus this uh, carbon market will deliver China's uh, target. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Owen, how do you look at this multi-level organizational structure that China has put in place to not only coordinate its policy goals, but also uh, make these binding targets and, and enforce the, the realization of these targets. How, are there similar models in other countries in terms of how to realize climate uh, fight, you know, efforts fighting climate change? China's approach to having a fairly centrally planned economy and strong central environmental policies which trickle down to provinces, counties and municipalities is uh, both unique to China's own situation, as Professor Tong just mentioned, um, but also does see parallels with the approaches taken in many of China's peer countries in Asia and further abroad. The core challenge for China will be to create incentive structures for leadership at these municipal and provincial levels, in particular, that can incentivize environmental performance uh, can really send strong signals that pronounce GDP growth and development of, of basic infrastructure, manufacturing and industry is no longer the sole or primary goal of the uh, country, but rather a balanced growth paradigm mm. that helps to improve the quality of lives of the citizenry while also meeting these environmental okay. targets. Professor and creating these incentive structures will, will, will help drive that yeah. forward. Professor Tung, do you agree with the challenge that uh, Mr. Irwin just highlighted? And are there any efforts being undertaken to, in, to improve the incentive structures? Yeah, I think that that will be a challenge for China in the future, that to maximize the function of the carbon market and to replace mostly the command and control uh, mechanism which is uh, 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 going right now. I think that will be the biggest challenge for China to achieve the carbon picking and the carbon neutrality with the least cost. China has also 
highlighted a people-centered approach, I mean, to tackle climate change uh, while in improving socio -econo and economic development and uh, create jobs and eliminate poverty and all of that together in synergy. Professor Teng, how is it possible for China to create such an approach and uh, in, in other countries are, are they taking a different approach? Can you do, can you fight climate change without really taking people's interest at the, at the core of your effort? I think that there is a consensus that among countries that we need to deal with climate change within the context of sustainable development, that we should regard climate change as one of the broader social development issues. Uh, there is a consensus. And I think that the, the uh, China that put people in uh, the center of the whole thing that uh, reflect uh, um, these uh, uh, issues and also uh, I think that in the Chinese uh, people's central uh, uh, narratives, which also means uh, to consider the current generation, but also highlights importance of future generation because of in the white paper, it also highlights this responsibility for future generations. So those intergeneration equity is also a concern for China. Mr. Irwin, finally, fighting climate change uh, to protect the fundamental interests of the people is a common goal of countries. Do you see any nuance in the Chinese approach? Certainly. I think that China is correct in putting forward plans that place human development, poverty eradication, improvements to quality of life alongside environmental targets and goals. And there's precedent for that in the decoupling of economic growth and emissions growth in other parts of the world, including Europe, the United States, and elsewhere, where we do see emissions decline happening alongside economic growth. The thing that I would add to what Professor Tong has just described is that I think China also has the opportunity to enhance the role of civil society and people-based movements on the environment in the country, which are already robust but could expand and could redouble the country's efforts uh, if they are uh, allowed to and encouraged to flourish on environmental issues and that uh, the government's ability to make the case effectively that it's in the interest of the citizenry to get behind these environmental efforts okay. uh, will be essential to them being met. All right, we're going to leave it there. Many thanks to my guests, Professor Tung Fei from Tsinghua University and Jackson Irwin from Duke University.